Right, I think we're at six o'clock. Dave, shall we? Uh, Mama. Mama. Okay. I can mute them all um, if you wish. Uh, you could do a mute all actually, yeah, apart from me. If that's uh, just for anyone who's not. not yeah, that's here. a point. Yeah. Good evening. Right, yeah, okay, so good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the fifth lecture of the Midland Centre of the Railway Division of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Um, I think I'll start off just by you know, hoping everybody's well and staying safe in the current situation. We're obviously still doing remotely at the moment because of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing, ongoing situation. Um, so yeah, I, I do hope uh, you and families and friends are, are staying well through all of this. Um, before we before we kick off, uh, or before I introduce the speaker and the lecture, I'll just um, remind everybody about logistics for, for this evening. So if I could ask everybody to remain on, um, turning off video is sometimes helpful for bandwidth as well. So uh, you can do that. This is we're using Zoom tonight, which is different to the uh, the remote um, lecture system that we used in the lectures we did before Christmas. So please bear with us. I think we're okay. We've used it in other circumstances, but not live in a lecture. So uh, if you do have any issues, um, please, please be patient. Um, as usual, we'll run the lecture. If you can hold off, uh, we won't take any questions or answers during the lecture. We'll do that at the end. Can I ask, uh, the Zoom um, facility has got a, a chat function, which everyone should have access to. So like we're doing with the web, using for the other lectures that we've done. If you can um, load up your uh, question at any point, actually, they'll obviously load up in sequence, and I'll run I'll run the question and answer session at the end, and we'll. So without further ado, tonight's lecture and our speaker. So our speaker is Aidan Diver, who's a project manager at Porterbrook. Uh, which is also where I work. So I know Aidan well, um, and I, I am also involved in the project uh, he's going to be discussed tonight. So Aidan has been at Porterbrook since 2018. Um, he's a uh, graduate, graduate of mechanical engineer, um, as you'd expect, uh, um, and has worked in the rail industry in the, in the short time he's had in, in his career so far. Um, both in, uh, in, in track machinery uh, items and then, as I say, at Porterbrook. He spent most of his time at Porterbrook on the FLEX programme, um, heavily involved in a lot of the engineering and in more recent times picking up um, one of the project management roles. This is, this is a programme, there are sort of several projects in the FLEX programme. So um, uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Aidan and uh, Look forward to his lecture on the class 769 flex. Okay, cheers. I'm going to turn off my uh, video so you're not staring at the side of my head. Um, and I'm going to uh, apologize um, in advance if I take any pauses. That I'm, I'm having a drink. If the pauses are too long, that means my internet's cut out. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I wish you all a happy new year. I still think it's early enough for that. Um, I hope everybody managed to make the most of the Christmas break under the very strange circumstances we're in. And I hope everyone is managing to stay well and sane. Uh, so I'm going to start by giving a very brief intro into me. I think Jason for most of this, but I'm going to it again, uh, uh, mainly why I'm qualified to give this presentation. So I'm Aidan Diver, I've been a project engineer at Portbrook for two and a half years. And for all of that time, I've worked on this project. Uh, I've mainly been focused on the technical side, both the buy mode and the try mode. Uh, and most recently, for just over a year, I've been a project manager on the role of the project. Um, so you might be wondering why there are pictures of my dogs on the screen. Uh, that is because uh, this is my advanced warning and apology. Uh, I do have dogs and they have been known to interrupt me from time to time. So 
couple of things in advance if that does happen. Um, before we get started, I will just say I have to get a little bit of feedback. So anybody still on mute, could you mute yourself? Okay, so I'm going to give a quick run through um, some of the to topics I'm going to touch on today. I'll start with the basics of what Flex is and why Flex was required. I'll then provide a top level technical overview. I'll briefly touch on the main challenges faced and how these have been overcome. I'll break down the different projects for the different operators involved in the project. And then I'll provide updates on the current state of the projects. Uh, and then I'm going to finish off with a few slides on the ROG project specifically. So firstly, what is flex? So it's very, very simplest terms. Flex is the addition of uh, diesel engines to an electric train. Uh, and why is flex a project? So there are a number of reasons and benefits behind the project. Firstly, it is a response to an industry issue, um, which is the lack of electrification. Um, so you can see there that there is, uh, I'll just turn my laser pointer on. Uh, there is only 42% of the network uh, is currently electrified. It was intended by now that a lot more of the, net, the network would be electrified, um, but plans for this have been postponed. Another reason uh, for Flex is the life extension of an asset. So uh, Porterbrook being a Roscoe or a leasing company obviously has an interest in extending the life of assets that are near or at the end of life. And another main reason was the ambition across the industry and I guess um, other transport sectors um, to become greener, reduce emissions and to decarbonize. So there is a point here about um, the addition of engines to an electric train is the opposite of decarbonization and that point has been made before. Uh, but the point to note and the counter argument to that is that we're, we're creating a bi-mode or a tri-mode train uh, that will be able to be used on existing electric infrastructure to operate on routes that otherwise would have been filled by locos or DMUs operating only in uh, diesel mode. So effectively, the total amount of diesel operation is reduced because of this modification. Okay, so a little bit more information now into the host train. And the 319. Uh, the 319 is a 30 year old dual voltage EMU, uh, meaning it can operate on both AC and DC infrastructure. It's got a fairly outdated DC traction system, which is actually retained uh, during flex. Um, so the 319 is made up of four cars, uh, two driver trailer vehicles, one at each end, a pantograph motor coach, which contains the traction equipment and an auxiliary, auxiliary trailer vehicle. So flex is the addition of diesel alternator rafts on each of the driver trailer units, vehicles, sorry. Um, the flex design and modification currently is applicable to the 319 noughts and the 3094s. Uh, these are pretty much identical with the uh, only exception being that the uh, fours have a first class area in one of the DTs. This doesn't impact flex um, modification, but it, it's, it's a, a point to note. Okay, uh, moving on to the top level technical overview. So this slide uh, gives a view of the 769 underframe and shows some of the major or uh, larger components and, and where they're located. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning at this point that there are two variations of the flex modification. Uh, there's bi-mode and tri-mode. Bi-mode is um, AC and DC operations and tri-mode is the operations in AC, DC and diesel. Uh, what I'm going to run through uh, over the next few slides is applicable to both variants um, as these are pretty much the same. They're about 90-95% the same uh, and then I'll touch on the differences with tri-mode uh, at the end of the section. Okay, so starting at number one is the uh, TC, the track circuit assister or TCA. So because the unit will be operating in diesel mode, some assistance uh, will be required to operate existing track circuits. So an aerial is installed onto the leading bogey of each uh, driver trailer vehicle. And next is uh, the fuel tank. So surprisingly, um, speaking to a room full of mechanical engineers, when you add an engine to a train, you also need fuel. So you also need a fuel tank. 
Um, as you can see, the tank is located here and takes quite a large space envelope. Next is the electrical cubicle, um, which is another large component or piece of equipment. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a few slides. Fourth is the, uh, the diesel alternator raft, the main equipment. So quite a large assembly, uh, contains the engine, contains the alternator and some also some integral interface systems. And finally, we've got another component, large in a different way to the others. Um, it's the uh, exhaust, but this also, this routes from the back end of the train to the um, DA raft, but this also includes the SCR after treatment. So hopefully, I, I, I hope already I'm trying to show that flex isn't as simple as I made it out two slides ago. It's a lot more than just adding an engine to um, a train. There's a whole bunch of other equipment that is also required as part of the modification too. Okay, so speaking in a little bit more detail now um, on the diesel alternator raft, there is one DA raft fitted to each DT vehicle. Uh, the raft is a fabricated and assembled support frame. It will it contains a man engine that is uh, Cat 3B compliant, as well as an alternator and other interface systems, such as the, uh, the cooling system and the SCR. Um, in its totality, the raft alone weighs approximately four tons. As I mentioned previously, uh, one of the interface systems located on the raft uh, that is integral uh, to the engine is uh, the cooling system. So the coolant system is located on the cooler side of the raft or the wet side of the raft and contains three main components. So you've got the radiator, which is actually on the back end of the raft there that you can't see on that picture. You can see it better on this picture. The header tank located there on the right and the cooling fans. Uh, so cooling fans actually also have a, a reversible function that is used to clear various debris, such as leaves that would potentially build up on the outside of the radiator, which is quite a nice little feature. And uh, another integral interface to the engine is the induction in the exhaust system. Uh, so again, this has three main components. You've got the charge air cooler, uh, which provides pressurized and cooled air to the engine. Uh, the SCR or selective catalytic reduction, which includes um, the dosage of AdBlue to reduce NOx gases um, by up to 85%. And then you've got the exhaust pipe work, uh, which as well as acting as a standard exhaust provides the interface for injecting and mixing the AdBlue into the exhaust gases prior to um, SCR. Again, back to the fuel system. Um, the engine needs fuel tank. Um, so one tank is fitted per vehicle. Uh, it's located between the electrical cubicle and the surge tanks. It has a capacity of a thousand liters and is heated. Um, the fuel filters are also fitted with heaters that are energized in sub-zero temperatures. Okay, so the electrical cubicle now, um, again, there is one fitted per DT vehicle. Um, the electrical cubicle contains a large proportion of the electrical equipment fitted on flex and performs numerous functions. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail now on what these are, um, but there is a lot of complex electronics um, as the electrical cubicle basically acts as the brain of flex, uh, providing the interface from the new power from the engine to the outdated traction system and traction motors. Now we've got the 24 volt box. Again, there is one of these fitted to each DT. You can see the location there. Um, the 24 volt box has two primary functions. The first being providing power to start the engines via the engine start module here, um, which is a super, super capacitor. Um, and this, this works similarly to the way a battery works on a car. And secondly, uh, providing filtered air supply to the alternator for cooling. So on this picture here, you can see that yellow item, that's actually a spin tube filter. Uh, that filters the air as it goes into this box. And then you can see some ducting there um, where the airflow will go to the alternator for cooling. 
So this next slide, I think, is a is a very useful uh, visualization of actually the amount of equipment that is in, installed as part of the flex modification. Um, I think, it, yeah, it just it's just a really good visual. You can see all the different pieces of equipment: um, fuel tank, electrical cubicle, DA raft, the way the exhaust mounts. Um, the next picture is a sim similar visual, so I'm going to take that opportunity uh, to get a drink. Okay, so yeah, before and after comparison, like I said, a really good visual. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see um, the 319 before flex modifications. Um, it looks empty, it is empty, it's very bare. Um, when I first saw it, I, I thought, is something missing? But no, that's like actually how it is. Um, and then on the right, you can see the 769. So, so the underframe after flex has, uh, flex conversion has occurred and it's completely full it's the opposite of what it was before so you, again you can see the uh, the extent of the modification okay so now the differences on um, the tri-mode flex variant so uh, I mentioned at the start that the bi-mode is AC and diesel and the tri-mode is AC DC and diesel so on the bi-mode units we remove the shoe gear Whereas on the tri-mode units, we don't remove the shoe gear. Uh, although we don't retain them in the same position, we move them from the number one end leading bogey and put them on the number two end trailing bogey of the driver trailer vehicle. So this, this uh, fleet can operate in three modes. Again, uh, another major difference on the tri-mode project is the uh, removal of the motor alternator set and replacement with a, an auxiliary power supply, which is a static converter. The reasons for this are, are one, because it's um, a lot more re reliable and new than the existing MA set, but two, to provide um, the required power output that the air cooling, which is another modification on this variant is. Um, so yeah. Okay, so um, touching on some of the challenges now that the project has faced, one of the challenges is the age of the 319. So due to its age, there have been a number of host unit issues on the project that have required rectification prior to um, input or during uh, actual production. Um, so the way that we have tried to mitigate this issue is by having a dedicated team um, and a flex prep stage. So the dedicated team work in the flex prep stage to identify and rectify any host train defects and potential arising work. So another challenge is the recommissioning. Um, the majority of the units uh, were stood down and out of service and storage for quite a considerable time. Um, so comprehensive recommissioning is required. Uh, what we've done now is we've got a fixed um, scope for recommissioning. And again, that is carried out at the flex prep stage at Gemini prior to um, flex production. The corrosion uh, linked to both of the points above, this is due to the age of the vehicle, but also due to the fact that the vehicles have been in storage for a, a number of years. Um, so it was identified in the very early stages of production um, that the DT floors had severe corrosion um, and the floor on the flex unit acts as the, fire the, the primary fire barrier to um, the engines so all of this required extensive repair so what we do now is all the floors are inspected and rectified again at the flex prep stage prior to flex production so another area of uh, corrosion that we've had on the on the units are is in the saw bars um, due to the fact we had around seven and a half eight tons of equipment on the dts it's important that the saw bars have the uh, required structural integrity to put up with the additional mass so now we have all units scanned way in advance uh, while the units are still in storage. Um, so any areas of concern can be uh, highlighted in advance and any areas that require rectification uh, can also be highlighted in advance and then rectified again at the flex prep stage. Uh, another final uh, large challenge that I think that we've had um, is the lack of a first of a kind or prototype unit instead moving straight into a production. So what Brush have done now is introduced a, a pulse line or a, a typical production line. And, and this has really allowed them to um, kind of stick to 
a lot more consistent beat rate uh, with uh, higher quality and um, efficiency. So I mentioned on the previous slide that uh, we've had a lot of issues with corrosion across the project. The, the pictures on the, the page now um, are some examples of this that we have actually um, faced on the project. These are all flex examples. Um, on the top left, this is the, a pantograph well. This is the outside of a pantograph well where we've, we expect this hole has occurred from arcing and then the water ingress has gone there. And it must have been like that for quite a considerable amount of time to see that extent of rotting of the interior uh, structure of the ceiling there. On the rock top right um, is an electrical cubicle. So again, you can see the amount of water ingress that we've got, the amount of corrosion that is in the, uh, the box itself, and then also corrosion on that, the electrical items. So uh, electrical items obviously don't like um, water or being rusty. Um, the bottom two pictures are pictures, uh, examples of the soil bar corrosion um, that I mentioned. So on the left hand side, the outer soil bar has been completely cut out. Um, so that's mid repair. And on the, the right hand side, uh, this is where the soil bar would uh, be repaired. Again, some of the soil bar repairs that have been undertaken are, are really extensive. They're massive. In some instances, four meters worth of soil bar is replaced and then repaired. Um, so that's been a big issue. Okay, so now I'm going to um, touch on the four flex projects within the program. First of all, we've got Northern, um, eight bi-mode units operating on AC and diesel. Then we've got Transport for Wales. So we've got nine bi-mode capable units. The reason why I say capable is because um, these are bi-mode units capable of operating in AC and diesel, but due to the lack of electric infrastructure on the Welsh network, these will only be operating in diesel mode. So the pantographs have been temporarily removed. And then we've got the Great Western project, which is our largest project, um, 19 tri-mode units. So operating in AC, DC and diesel. Uh, and these include the addition of the static converter, like I mentioned previously, and the air cooling. And finally, we have the ROG projects, which contains two bi-mode units. Um, these operate in AC and diesel. And again, this project has the added complexity of the freight conversion. So uh, here you can see a more detailed breakdown of the modifications included across the four projects. Um, the top scope is the flex, um, core flex scope and the bottom scope here is all of the additional scope in the project. So I'm not gonna go through it all right now. I'll touch on it a little bit more in, in the following slides, um, but it is designed to show that all four projects aren't exactly the same. They are quite different. There is a lot going on outside, outside of just the flex modification. So it is, it is quite a, a challenging program. Okay, so now modifications across all four work streams. Um, uh, we've got the TCA, which I touched on earlier, and then we've got the installation of an ethernet backbone. So the ethernet backbone contains two networks, a red and a blue. Uh, the red network is required for flex engine communication and is not available for any other uses. Um, and the blue network supports um, some of the less safety critical functions such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, passenger counting, and anything else that the operator might um, intend to put on there. Oops, sorry. Then we've got the simplified um, parking brake installation. So this mod is required in order to free up a train wire uh, for the TCA fault sign signaling. And then finally, we've got the guard's door control panel. Uh, so this is actually a northern led mod and it allows the driver operation only controls on the cab desk uh, to be utilized for new flex controls um, and then the doors are operated by the guard within the vestibules at each door. Some of the modifications that are specific just to Transport for Wales fleet, it's worth pointing out at this point that the fleet is nine um, units and Five of those are 769 noughts and four of those are 7694. So again, they're the two different bi-mode versions. Um, the only difference there is um, the first class seating in the fours. Uh, but the modifications that are carried out 
on this fleet are CCTV, saloon and forward facing. So there's a picture of the saloon CCTV and installation of at seat power. So here you can see the USB ports that have been installed next to the seats. Um, and again, there are pantograph removal. Um, the modifications, the CCTV and at seat power mo modifications, um, although it's one across the whole fleet, that, that like I said, the seating layouts are slightly different. So the modifications for each fleet are slightly different. And moving on to the, uh, the Great Western branch of the project. So these modifications are just specific to Great Western. I've mentioned before the air cooling, um, but there are four air cooling modules um, installed per vehicle, 16 across the unit. Um, and due to the additional mass of, of, these, of these modules across the unit and the original requirement to stay within the existing crush mass of a bimode, uh, the, the seating layout was changed to compensate for that. So what we've done is we've added um, additional seats within the saloons and additional luggage stacks, which prevents um, or reduces the number of um, passengers that can stand, uh, reducing the overall crush. Another modification is the three phase distribution and additional unit wires. So this again is um, in support of the air cooling. The, the air cooling operates off three phase power. The new static converter provides three, three phase power and uh, the three phase distribution mod um, is the routing of that um, three phase power across the unit. And then similar to the TFW units, we have saloon and forward facing CCTV. So that's a picture of the uh, the forward facing CCTV from the cab, and then installation of at seat power. These again are different modifications because the layout again has changed on the tri mode uh, version of the modification. And then finally, we have an LED headlight installation. So the older um, headlights were removed and replaced by newer, more reliable, and energy efficient headlights. Okay, another slide basically just to kind of sell the scale of the project um, is the key supplies that have been involved in the project. And these are all um, supplies that have had real heavy involvement in the project, um, but it's not just the main one in brush. And you've also got Gemini who carry out the recommissioning, the corrosion, a lot of the um, flex prep work and a lot of the additional modifications work. Um, and then there's DG8 who have had a lot of input behind the scenes into the additional modifications. Um, people like Pullman, who have provided the TFW project a lot of uh, production support specifically, and then the rest just general day to day support, um, ongoing support across the project. Okay, so I'm going to give a, a, a current status update of where the units are currently at across the four projects. So on Northern, we have all units uh, delivered and on lease, and they are currently undergoing operator driver training. Um, and service introduction is imminent. On the TFW fleet, we have eight units that have been delivered and on lease. Six of these units are available for service uh, with two currently undergoing operator-led interior and exterior refresh programs. Um, and there is one unit still in our production. So on the Great Western project, we have six units that have actually completed flex conversion and are being prepared for delivery. Um, two units are set to be delivered this month to begin fault-free running and mileage accumulation. And on the ROG project, we have one out of the two units has been delivered. So as I said at the start, I have acted as the uh, project manager, Porterbrook's project manager on the ROG Flex project. It's um, an area of the Flex project that's a little bit newer and a little bit less well publicized. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail about that. Uh, and this is the start of that. So as, the, as a part of Flex, uh, uh, sorry, as a part of the ROG Flex project, there are two uh, BIMED units 319009 and 319010 or 31910. Um, these were non-PRM units, so they hadn't already been utilized for any of the passenger flex projects, and that made them perfect candidates for the ROG project as they um, would undergo conversion from passenger units into light logistics freight units. Uh, the freight conversion of the modification is led by Rail Ops Group, ROG, and completed alongside and in parallel to flex conversion. So 319 
has completed its flex conversion and is now currently undergoing freight conversion. And 319009 is currently undergoing flex prep and freight conversion before being inputted into flex production later this year in March. So at the start of the ROG project, um, a freight conversion feasibility specification was uh, commissioned to uh, understand if converting a 319 or a 769 to a unit capable of carrying light freight was possible. Um, so the report identified components that would require removal, uh, which was basically all interior components that don't need to be retained. Uh, it highlighted potential modifications for the components in the interior that did require retaining. And then it also investigated um, the means of retaining the freight. Okay, so this is um, what was found for the components requiring removal. Uh, as you can see along the side, a few uh, common components were identified. Again, these are components that wouldn't be required in a freight vehicle. And this picture on the right shows uh, an empty DT vehicle. Okay, and some of the potential modifications that were highlighted as part of the freight spec was the relocation of the OTMR and the brake res isolation cock. Um, so as you can see in the pictures, the OTMR enclo enclosure and terminal box enclosure are located under the seats and the brake res isolation cock enclosure is also located under the seats. Um, once the seats are removed, these are then in the way of potential freight. So both of these pieces of equipment um, required relocating as they also required retaining. Um, so uh, effectively in a, a different position would be required to be found for, for these items. Okay, um, so another potential modification was the potential relocation of the high tension, tension cable. So this cable is um, the cable that goes from the pantograph um, to the transformer. And for some reason on a 319, it comes down smack bang in the middle of the saloon and takes up quite a large um, space. So as you can see on the right is um, existing uh, light freight rolling stock. And um, this high, high tension cable is actually rerouted re down an extended body end. Um, the difficulty with actually um, modifying this and rerouting this HD cable is that um, it's actually really thick. So it has a very large minimum radi bend radii. So routing from um, the pantograph down to the body end and then back up to the transformer will require a lot of bends, potentially tight bends. Um, however, it was concluded that it, it would be possible, just difficult and expensive and potentially for not that much um, gain space. Um, so it's not going to be carried out on the, uh, the first prototype units at ROG. So the spec also looked into a means of retaining the freight. Uh, so to do this, a comparative study was undertaken. As I mentioned before, the existing light freight rolling stock was looked at, and then uh, the auto industry was looked at. So your typical lorries and vans. Um, and you can see some of the similarities across the two with the, the horizontal load tracks installed here and here. And then you've got ratchet straps in both examples and heavy duty anti-slip floors as well. Uh, you can also see that the lorry has a transverse bar or strut, um, whereas the, the train doesn't. Um, and it's worth mentioning at this point, it was unclear as to how the freight would actually be transported um, as flexibility is still required from ROG um, in to, uh, for the potential different types of freight and different customers. Um, but an assumption was made at this point that trolleys would be used just to progress from uh, an analysis perspective. So these are images of the actual design that was come up within the specification. Um, and models of that design. So uh, you can see that the two hor horizontal load tracks have been used. Um, and in this case, additional um, removable struts in the doorways. This is to allow uh, trolleys to be stored within the, the vestibule area or the doorway area and so that the doors aren't damaged. Um, you can also see here how the transverse bars have also been added. 
Um, and the idea here is that these will be used every six trolleys um, just to spread the potential load of these trolleys out across the unit instead of one spot. Um, this model was then used to perform structural analysis of the design and uh, was completed basically to ensure that the 319 body shell could take the additional um, strain or force or mass of the freight uh, and retaining the freight in this way and the analysis showed that this this was sufficient and um, would be fine. So now what I haven't mentioned is that in alongside the two flex units that ROG um, will be having they also have a 319 that will be kept as a 319 but this has had its freight conver conversion already completed on it. Um, this was in the first instance to be used uh, just for demonstration purposes, um, but later may be used in working in parallel with some of the 769s. I'm mm -hmm. going to talk about uh, some of the mods that have actually been carried out on this unit. Um, and these uh, modifications can be carried over in some cases to the 769 units. So this is the OTMR re relocation. Um, this was identified within the um, conversion specification as I mentioned previously, and um, this is how the issue has been dealt with in reality. So it has been retained in the same position down the length of the vehicle uh, so that the routing of the existing cables could be kept similar as possible, um, but it, it's been moved from the floor to up high. Um, it won't interfere with potential trolleys because if trolleys are that high, then they're not gonna be able to get through the doors. So this, this was deemed the best position for them. Okay, so now um, this is how um, the retention of the freight has actually been dealt with. So they've gone with the two horizontal load tracks um, as well as the ratchet straps. Um, and the ratchet straps do connect directly to the load tracks. Here's a good example of it. That, that is removable and that, that, that can be attached to any position along these holes. So that is adjustable depending on the size of the freight that you have in, in there. Um, as part of the design uh, is they have also included the transverse bar that can be locked again into any one of these holes. So it's adjustable depending on, on where you want it to, uh, what type of freight you want it to support and where you want it along the vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, it's not shown now. I wish I had a picture of it. Okay, another modification that has taken place on the unit is the addition of access steps. Um, so it was identified that access to various isolation switches and circuit breakers uh, in the number one end of the PMOS body end and the number one end of the um, ATOS would be required. So on a normal 319 or 769, that if the driver needed access to any of these, any of this equipment or these body ends, he would just simply get out, walk down the train um, and access them. However, um, the driver's not gonna be able to do that on this unit as hopefully the saloons will likely be full of freight. Um, therefore, additional access, he'll, he'll have to get out and, and walk down the side and access is required. So steps are required to get back into the unit. So uh, a, additional steps have been added to the number one end of the PMOS, as well as this designated walkway um, to uh, the body end um, from either door. Uh, this space will be kept completely empty, free of freight for the entirety of, of, the, of the travel. And then the flooring. So um, again, I've mentioned a couple of times ROG's requirement for flexibility. Um, so they trialed a number of different flooring options. Uh, the first you can just see in the bottom there, but that was as per the specification. So the heavy duty anti-slip flooring. Um, and then they trialed a more heavy duty flooring, this checker, checker plate flooring here. And then uh, finally, they also trialed this rollerboard flooring. So again, this rollerboard flooring is useful if you aren't using trolleys um, and you're instead using pallets, um, where access would be very difficult. You'd be able to drop it in with a forklift, but then you'd have to struggle moving, moving it around afterwards inside. Um, these roller, basically roller bearings that are installed on the checker plate allow for um, the pallets to be easily manually moved around there without much difficulty. 
Okay, so as I said, it was uh, the 373 was um, originally intended to be used as a showcase unit, and it has been used at various demonstration days to showcase the product and demonstrate how it would work in terms of loading and unloading. Um, and I'm told it was met with a lot of enthusiasm and excitement from uh, the potential customers. So that's good news. It's probably also worth mentioning at this point that Porterbrook have agreed to lease a further 319 units to ROG. And there are conversations for more units in the future. And now um, finishing off with a nod to some of Porterbrook's other decarbonisation and in innovative projects. Top left is the flex that 319 flex that we've just talked about. Um, top right is Hydroflex, very well publicized. It was the first hydrogen train to operate on the main line. Um, Porterbrook are now um, proceeding to Hydroflex Mark II. Um, bottom left hand corner is Hybrid Flex. Um, uh, this is a modification on our turbo stars that replaces the diesel engine with a diesel and battery power pack um, with the idea being uh, the first mile, last mile are on battery. So a green first mile, last mile. And then finally, uh, not a decarbonization project, but an innovative project is our innovation hub. Um, so this is a 319 that is at Long Marston and is showcased at, annually at Rail Live. Um, this provides SMEs uh, an opportunity to showcase some of their novel new and interesting ideas that they might not get the chance to showcase uh, without fleet rollout. Um, so that's, like I say, actually attendable um, when the world gets back to normal, hopefully later this year, maybe, fingers crossed, um, Rail Live will be on and um, you might get the, I, I would highly recommend if you get the opportunity to visit um, Rail Live, do so and attend the Innovation Hub, it, it, you, it'll be worth it. Okay, so that's the end there. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hopefully I've provided some uh, clarity and info on uh, Flex as an entire program. Um, any questions? Thanks, Aidan. That was, um, yeah, a very clear and it came across very well on the, on the, uh, on the video, for me anyway, and, and a, a nice detailed presentation. So I hope everybody found that interesting. Um, there are some questions, so without further ado, I will um, I will moderate them. So, uh, da, 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 if I start off, so the first question is from Graham Beale. With um, approximately 16 tonnes added for the flex mod, how do point-to-point -point timings of class 769 in diesel mode compare with those of the class 150s that I'll work alongside, uh, mentioning the, the northern routes, for example? Aidan, I don't know if you want to uh, have a go answering that. Yeah, so um, the uh, one of the remits at the start of the project was uh, to have these uh, perform very similarly to the 150s, and they do. So yeah, the point to point times are similar, or if not better, than the 150s. Okay, very good, thank you. Right, the next question. Has the reverse fan function on the cooler been tested and proven to work? Leaves can be stubborn um, and take a lot of shifting. I, I know that from my own experience on uh, on early diesel fleets earlier in my career. So, uh, Aidan, over to you on that one. Um, they've been tested in a production environment, but I'm not sure if they've been tested in service as of yet. Um, so, I, I'm not sure on that one. Yeah, I and mean, I'll just add, add to that myself. Obviously, uh, the, the TFW units are now in service and we're starting to gain some experience. So. Um, all I can say is the uh, you know the design that was done was was um, was you know through brush was done on the basis of experience uh, on other fleets and and um, and yeah the thing was that the, the fan was sized and and rated accordingly so we we'll wait and see whether it's actually doing everything uh, in the longer term but um, so far so good. Okay, the next question: um, Could you expand on why? Uh, the addition of a TCA is required, uh, as I would, as, as, as Peter Vincent's written, as I would have expected the weight of the additional equipment to improve tra track circuit operation. Yeah, so I, I wasn't around at the time the decision was made, um, so I can't comment on the detail, um, but I am aware that at the time, again, there was some uncertainty as to if a TCA would be required, um, which is why it isn't 
completely part of the flex modification. It was decided that the TCA was required. So I expect that is because of um, the weight wasn't quite uh, sufficient. I don't, uh, that's, that's my guess. Yeah, I mean, that's my understanding as well. That during the design, it was felt that um, the calculations that were done determined that a, a track uh, circuit assistor would be necessary. So, uh, so that was incorporated into the design. Uh, okay, the next question, were there any extra complications for the ROG units to take account of weight differences, uh, i.e. light versus fully laden? Um, so that is, that's, a, that's a long answer question, that is. Um, the ROG unit isn't currently in service, so that is, that's more of an operational one. Um, I do know when the unit did leave brush, it was completely empty, so it required ballasting just for its transit journey. Um, yeah, I think when when ROG get to the point where these units are in service, they're going to need to do some um, calculations to understand the differences when the unit is empty uh, versus full, uh, and uh, that will be operational. Okay, thanks, Aidan. Okay, the next question is from Jamie Davis. What has been the greatest challenges within initiating the bi-mode core conversion project and what lessons have been learned for future complex projects? I'll let you... Um, so I, I touched on some of the challenges. I personally, I think um, the biggest challenge was um, the speed in which it moved uh, and the lack of a, um, a first of a kind or prototype. Um, it meant there was a lot of issues at the start that were highlighted. Um, I think that has fed into some of our other projects. For example, Hydroflex is, uh, we're trialing one unit and then we're moving on to trial a second unit. Hybridflex, the same, we're trialing just one unit. And I don't um, think any projects of this size will probably go straight to production again within Portsbrook. I don't know if you have anything different there, Jason. No, I think I'd, I'd agree with that as a headline, a headline comment. I think the... Um, the ambition, the politics at the time that Flex was um, was put into play, um, and the, the the technical complexity, which it's probably fair to say, um, you know, a number of stakeholders underestimated. Uh, just you know, with hindsight, it would have been better to have done a, a first in class uh, and and get things um, you know developed and, and shaken out properly, rather than than having a production program right on the back of that. So uh, so that's probably the headline headline lesson, which we've learnt and, uh, and we're, we're applying. Okay, uh, um, next question, another question from Peter Vincent. I, I'm, I'm just reading out what he's written. I know that you have not mentioned refurbishment of the passenger areas, uh, which I recall were rather tired even before the units were stood out of service. Was consideration given to including a refurbishment programme? Um, so the TFW fleet, um, after it's finished flex, is then it goes through a refurbishment program for both the exterior and the interior. So the interior is refurbished um, by TFW as part of that project after we've had it. Um, the Great Western Fleet, the refurbishment was actually included in our program. And um, that was another one of the differences with that fleet. Um, so that had the new livery external and the new um, um, seating and livery and whatnot. So that did have a uh, refurbishment program. I'm not, I don't think Northern had a refurbishment program, but I'm led, I think they came out of service and then went back into service. So they were out for the least amount of time. So I potentially didn't need a, a refurbish. Yeah, that's correct, Aidan. They were, um, yeah, the, the Northern donor units, well, the, the donor units for the Northern Flex were from Northern uh, and the choice was made not to um, not to do a, an upgrade as part of the flex program for, for that particular fleet. Okay, next question. Um, would the replacement of the DC traction system with AC confer any increase in future flexibility? Uh, well, a pass potentially um, because AC systems are um, more modern and reliable, um, but not being an electrical engineer, I, I'm not sure. I think th I'd guess that the um, additional expense to do that probably wouldn't um, make up for the, the benefit you'd get. Okay, uh, question from Martin Elliott. 
did you have to make any changes to the brake system or suspension to accommodate the extra weight? Yes, the, the suspension is uh, altered on the driver trailer units. Um, the primary suspension um, stiffness is changed. Um, the brake system, no. No changes were made to the brake system. Just validation that the braking performance was within the required curves. Yes. Yeah. So additional mass uh, and uh, and then in, in both tear and um, and crush. Okay. Next question from Richard Hill. What is the market interest in the freight conversion? Uh, have any potential customers be confirmed? Well, I think it's really probably for Rob to to advise on that. But I'll, Aidan, I'll let you answer. <clears throat> yeah, so there, there, is, um, there are no customers confirmed as of yet, but this is where I will plug um, Carl Watts, who is CEO of ROG. He is doing a presentation to the IMEC, um, I believe, on the 21st, and he's going to talk a little bit more about um, freight within the railway. Um, so if you're interested, I'd, I'd recommend going along to that. Good. Okay. Next question from James Johnson. Uh, Johnson, sorry. What what were the biggest challenges relating to approvals for the conversion? Um, so tri mode has, has been the obviously the, the biggest challenge because the most has gone on um, with the most modifications, um, changes in mass suspension, gauging changes. Um, so it's, it's definitely been the tri mode project has been the, the biggest challenge for approvals. I, I don't know if there's been one area specifically that I can think of that's been worse than anything else. Um, Jason, I don't know if you can think of anything. Not particularly. Do you want to say anything around? Um, I mean, we've, we've got an approval strategy that uh, that was, was put in place at the start of the project, uh, and we're using sort of independent um, safety bodies to, to gain various uh, approval building blocks. Um, so it's been quite challenging from an integration point of view. Um, and the, some of the complexity and novelty has required a level of depth and work, I guess, that again, probably was underestimated right at the start of the program. Um, but like any, anything, you know, whether it's new build or any upgrades like this, it's, um, it, it's going through the, the steps and, and following the required processes and, and carefully managing the approval, um, the approval project, which is a project in its own right. Okay, next question. How many more units are you hoping looking to flex and lease to prospective customers? Uh, I'll leave that question to you, Jason, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Aidan. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I, again, I, you know, there are, there are some, um, some 319s that are still available for flex conversions. Um, I, think, I think it's a mix of we'd be happy to to provide some more flex units um, with customers who are, are keen to do so. But um, um, yeah, I, I guess the I guess now we've got a product uh, and, we're, and we're sort of moving forward on the, on the freight. Side, uh, then that opportunity still stays there. So we're not. Um, yeah, there, there's some opportunities, um, but equally, we're, I guess the message very much is we're still focused on delivering the commitments that we've got at the moment. OK, next. Um, all right. Now, um, Spencer Jones, I think this is in, in Porterbrook, has put a message up. Um, so just to clarify a, a point on the, uh, the track circuit point, there is a TCA risk assessment tool which showed the four car unit was marginal and very route dependent. Um, and because we wanted the class 769 to have a number of routes of operation, the TCA has been fitted to allow for a greater number of routes. So that just provides a bit more clarity. Uh, a point from uh, from Christian, one of the committee members, who's I know is involved in the in the project in uh, in Brush. He's just made the point that there were only four units ordered initially. This, this predates quite a few people who are currently on the project, including myself. Um, so the prototype wasn't deemed required or necessary at that point. Um, so as I, as I sort of alluded to, I think the, the the sort of context of how Flex came into being. Um, sort of creates yeah, the, the, 
situation changed, I suppose, and the where we are now is very different from the original um, the original uh, ambition. Another question from Martin Elliott: Is the plan to reinstate the pantographs on the TF? Is there a plan to reinstate the uh, the pantographs on the TFW units when and if the Welsh electrification program uh, gets going? Yes. Yeah, so, if if um, there was a need for um, the pantograph to be reinstated, it can be if if Wales get electrification. Um, the unit was tested in AC mode, so it, it was confirmed as a bi mode capable unit. Um, so if, if electrification was to happen in Wales, that could happen, yeah. Great. Uh, and um, Fazana Hampshire, uh, SNC Lavalan, what is the range when operating on diesel? You're putting me on the spot here. I, um, If memory serves, I think it's about um, 600 miles. I think that was for Northern, though. So it is specific, um, dependent on the route that you're running on. Um, I think Wales is a lot less than that just because they're running up and down hills and they've got a lot more stop starts um, in the valleys. So um, it is dependent, but I think we said to Northern around 600 miles in, in the remit. Yeah, that's, that's, that's about right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, it's route dependent, but, uh, but nominally it's, uh, it's around 600 miles with, a, with uh, the fuel tank range. Okay, uh, and another point from Christian, who's, who's I know is at Brush on the design side. There are a thousand litres. Uh, we got a thousand litres of fuel. So um, just to put that in context. Yeah. Um, thank you from uh, Malcolm De Bell uh, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Malcolm. I think that's come to the end of the questions. There's some thank yous coming through. Uh, actually, sorry, one more question from George Fletcher here, which I'll just do, and then I think we'll, we'll bring it to a conclusion. Could the new power packs and control system be readily used on another class? Um, no, probably not, because the power pack is now um, doesn't meet the new um, uh, EU standards, so is now obsolete. Um, I'm not from a technical perspective. I'm not sure how much of a challenge that would be, um, but I guess it would. I think I'd guess that it'd take quite a bit of work again. Great. Okay. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Aidan. Thanks for everybody who's raised questions. Um, that was a good, good uh, range. Um, I'll, at this point, I'll hand over to Dave Coxon, who is going to do the vote of thanks. Well, um, uh, I can only echo the uh, comments that are flooding in at the moment, uh, praising your uh, presentation and the clear and uh, interesting way you put it over. Personally, I just thought it was a one-off and uh, you've enlightened me considerably that there are a lot of trains being uh, converted. And I wonder if you'd had second thoughts when you started finding all the rust, but uh, I suppose with a 30 year old train, this is a par for the course. But again, once again, Aidan, very interesting, very topical and I wish you all success with it in the future. Cheers, Dave. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Dave, for that. And I'll just echo my thanks to, to Aidan for um, very much his presentation. So, thanks, Aidan. You put that put that across very well. Right, just before um, for those who are still on, just before we finish, just some final points. Thank you for me for attending. I hope um, I hope you found it interesting, and the technology seems to have worked again. So I hope it. Uh, Dave, Dave alluded to it seems to have come across well, uh, not least helped by Aidan's delivery. So thank you for that. Um, just a reminder that the, our program is on the IMECI website. So if you go into the railway division um, area and the Midland Centre, we've got our own page, the contact details for the, the committee, our program, um, the wider railway division um, page, as you're probably all aware, has got the uh, quite a Quite a host of lectures. There's a, um, a lecture hub, I can't remember the exact name, but uh, there's a link uh, or should be a link from our program to it where there's quite a large number of, of lectures from around the centres this session that are recorded and, and loaded up. So um, during the lockdown, if, you want some, if you've got some spare time and you want to, to look, there's some really interesting things in there. Um, a reminder that our next lecture is the 10th of February and it's the Future Engineers competition. 
So we'll be doing it virtually this year, uh, which will be a bit of a change, but all being well um, as uh, you know, interesting and competitive as it normally is in other years. So we'll have a, a uh, small number of um, young engineers competing for the future engineer regional competition and the winner going on to the final in London. So I look forward to seeing or, or being on, online with a number of you, if not all of you, uh, on that date. So with that, that concludes proceedings. Um, thanks for attending. Have a good evening and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye to everyone.